Chapter 15. Arrival at Savannah. On February 5th, 1736, the Simmons passed Peepers Island, the first piece of land belonging to the colony of Georgia. Charles stood up as far in the bow as he could, watching eagerly as the ship nosed into the Savannah River and made its way slowly upstream. He was glad when the ship's captain came to stand beside him because he had so many questions to ask. What are those great twisted trees with enormous limbs, he asked, and all those black and white birds with the bubbling song? The captain looked at him with surprise. Why, you're a regular poet, Mr. Wesley, and you can think of something other than sin and salvation. There's some on this ship that had never believed that. God made the world, Charles said simply, and this is a part of it I've never seen before. Yes, said the captain. Well, the trees are live oaks. They're evergreen oaks, and their wood is fine for shipbuilding. And the birds, asked Charles, watching one bird in particular, swaying on a reed and singing a tune that rollicked upward like the musical scale. Reed birds, I call them, said the captain, though the Indians call them rice birds. He pointed deeper into the marsh where tall gray-blue birds stood motionless. Those are blue herons, he said, much like the storks we have in England. If you look closely, Mr. Wesley, you may see a crocodile, too, along the bank or in the water. They're ugly beasts with their horny skin. What do they look like besides being ugly? asked Charles. Like lizards, only a hundred times bigger than any we have in England. They have long heads with jaws that can bite a man's leg and take it right off, and tails that can kill a man with a single lash. If they're that big, said Charles, surely a man can see one coming and keep his distance. The captain shook his head. They lie low in the water, with just their bulging eyes staring out. They look like logs. So if you ever decide to swim in the Savannah River, and you will, since it's the only place to take a real bath, you'd be well advised to do it in the early morning, when all the beasts are asleep. And keep my eyes open, even so, said Charles. Even so. More of the passengers came on deck now, and the captain left Charles to speak to some of them. Mrs. Hawkins and Mrs. Welch promenaded by arm in arm, and close behind them came John Wesley. John held a book open in his hands, and his head was bent over it. Brother John, cried Charles, come and look at this new land you've come so far to see. John raised his head and looked at Charles, it is not the land I've come to see, but the people I've come to minister unto. Meanwhile, he indicated the book in his hands. I have this religious biography to finish. The Life of Lopez, I recommend it to you. And John continued to pace the deck, as if unaware of anything but the book he held. Charles looked after him briefly and once again compared himself unfavorably to his dedicated brother. The promenading women came round again, and this time they stopped by Charles. He spoke pleasantly to them, ready to tell them what he had learned from the captain. They ignored him, as if he were not there. So he turned his back on them, and again watched the shore. It will be pleasant to get ashore and away from this confining space, Mrs. Welch said. And from these spoil sport clergymen, said Mrs. Hawkins. If we had wanted to live the kind of life they'd have us live, we could have stayed in England. Charles, less of a crusader than John, determined to say nothing. Nothing that would let them know he'd heard their conversation. This attitude on his part, though, 
seemed to infuriate Mrs. Hawkins. I told them I'd make them sorry they ever came to this colony, she said. Mrs. Welch, evidently more timid than her friend, objected mildly. They came at Governor Oglethorpe's express invitation, she reminded her vengeful friend. Just then a sailor cried, Ahead, Savannah! And nearly everyone rushed forward to see it for himself. After four months at sea, any sign of habitation was welcome. The town was on a bluff above the river. As the ship drew close, Charles saw with a pang how different Savannah was from anything he had known before. The houses were mostly of rude, unpainted wood, or of what looked like hard red mud, though here and there was a larger, more elegant building. The streets were either dusty or sandy, because clouds of something were being stirred up by the crowds rushing down to see the ship. Behind the rough village was a great woods. The trees were so thick that the forest looked black. The Moravians were gathered on one side of the ship, and they sang a hymn of gladness for their safe arrival. As their songs had done all the way across the ocean, so now, too, they lifted Charles's spirits. He wished he had thought to bring his German flute on deck with him. It would, he was sure, have been a welcome accompaniment for the singers. Quite a welcoming party was on hand to greet Oglethorpe and the Wesleys. Josiah Hopke, the chief magistrate and governor in Oglethorpe's absence, was there with his niece, Mistress Sophie. Charles was surprised to see that Mr. Hopke wore a London gentleman's outfit with a high-waisted outer coat and a short flowered waistcoat, silk knee breeches, and stockings with clocks up the sides. Mistress Sophie, too, was dressed in the most recent fashion, pointed bodice fitting the figure, very full skirt, and high-heeled silken slippers. Unlike her London counterparts, though, her hair was unpowdered and unheaped. It hung in dark curls to her shoulders. With the magistrate and his niece was an Indian of huge physique. He was dressed in full chief's regalia, weighed down with ornaments. He stood proudly ready to greet the man who had come to bring his people the gospel. This is Tamochichi, chief of the creek, said Mr. Hopke to John. The chief inclined his head just slightly, and Charles was astonished to hear him say in perfect English, I am deeply pleased to meet you. Pretty Mistress Sophie took Charles's arm. You seem surprised that Tamochichi can speak our mother tongue, she said. She laughed softly. He speaks it better than many others in Georgia. Savannah itself is a mixture of German, French, Spanish, and Indian, Mr. Wesley, and English, of course. Charles was momentarily distracted by the crowd of Moravians who were being greeted wholeheartedly in German by others, ob obviously, of their own sect. That's Parson Spangenberg and his flock, said Sophie. They're building a large brick church in town. It will have a fine organ to accompany the very fine choir. Charles's heart began to beat faster when he heard Sophie's words. Are you fond of music, Miss Sophie? He asked. Oh, yes, she said. I played the harpsichord. And you, Mr. Wesley? I learned to play the organ when I was at Westminster School, Charles said, and I have my flute with me now. Sophie's eyes shone. You will have to come to my house, and we can play together, she said. John touched Charles's arm. Mr. Hopke is ready to drive us to the inn, he said. He bowed to Sophie, who curtsied to him. The magistrate's coach took Charles and John to the public house, 
a huge building made of hewn pine logs. Next to it was the church, roughly structured from unpainted planks which were chinked with mud. Inside, the public house smelled like public houses anywhere, or so Charles thought. The odors of English ale, of pork and cabbage, hung heavily on the air. The landlord, a big man with his sleeves rolled up, came to meet his guests. Each has his own room, Josiah Hopke asked, looking at the landlord. Oh yes, sir, just as you ordered, sir, said the man, and each his own body servant, too, sir. Josiah Hopke nodded. Then all's as should be, he told the brothers. The landlord will show you to your rooms, and I'll say farewell for now. Charles was delighted with his spacious room, which he didn't have to share, particularly after four months of being crowded onto the Simmons. He was even ready to accept the services of the colored man, who started to unpack for him as soon as his trunk was delivered. John, Charles soon discovered, was not at all happy with the luxurious arrangements. In particular, he would not allow the Negro to wait on him at all. I am used to waiting on myself, he told Charles. I do not propose to change my ways in that respect now. Charles objected. It seems to be the custom around here, he said, and I, I think we should fall in with it. John looked at him coldly. You always have been ready to fall in with things that suited you, he said. To Charles's surprise, John's words made him think of pretty Sophie Hopke and of her promise that they would make music together. I had not expected to find things to suit me in Savannah, he said, but I find several things that I'm going to like. John looked at him more severely than before. I intend to preach severely against frivolity, he said. Will you be one to whom I must preach first? 